Um, our, our faculty advisor this week is Dr. Atamali, who's the uh, ophthalmologist in chief of the hospital for sick children. And along with him, we've met a couple of our stellar residents, Saba and Mohab. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Ali and thank him for putting together this morning's rounds. Dr. Ali, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amandeep. Um, uh, I, I'm sure you're missing the cold here today in sunny Costa Rica. Um, so yeah, the uh, this, the cold reminded me of uh, being on call at Sick Kids. We get a lot of weird and wonderful things. So these are two cases that showed up within. 24 hours of each other um, in Christmas about a year ago. We have some good follow-up. Um, and uh, it's really, these are really uh, fishy stories from the deep. You'll see why in a minute. So uh, Seba and Mohab have done a wonderful job putting these uh, presentations together. And uh, without further ado, uh, Seba is gonna start and uh, I hand it over to her. All right, hello everyone. Uh, can you see my slide? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, um, hi, my name's Saba, I'm a PGY3, uh, um, and today I'll be presenting one of the cases for Pediatric Ophthalmology Grand Rounds, um, a fishy Christmas story, um, Horrors from the Deep Edition. Uh, so this is a case from uh, a holiday call of last year. <laughs> Um, so we have a presentation of a 17-year-old uh, female who came to Sickett's Hospital Emergency Department, uh, the water, to look for another phone that had uh, dropped inside. While she was doing this and uh, searching with her cell phone light, um, a needlefish that's pictured here jumped out of the water and stabbed her um, at the right near the right lateral canthus. Um, the patient herself immediately um, grabbed the fish and pulled it out and released it back in the water. And she noticed that she developed immediate right eyelid droop and her eye movements on the right side reduced as well from then. After returning from Cuba on vacation, she presented to a community hospital in Toronto and she had a CT orbits done that showed um, proptosis on the right side and evidence of um, orbital cellulitis with the small retroorbital abscess. Um, it was reported that her globes are intact and her brain parenchyma was unremarkable. So while she was there, she had blood work done that returned normal and she had cultures drawn as well. Um, she was started on um, broad spectrum IV antibiotics and given her tetanus booster and transferred to sick kids for orbital cellulitis management. So when she arrived, um, her exam is shown here. So she had a vision of 2150 in the right eye that pinhole to 2040. Um, her pressure was a little bit higher on the right side at 20 and 13 on the left. And she had a dilated, minimally reactive pupil on the right side. Um, and she didn't have a reverse RAPD. She had a normal pupil on the left. This is her anterior segment examination. So she had a lateral canthus laceration that was sutured on the right. She had noticeable proptosis. She also had reduced um, no corneal sensation on the right side, as well as no sensations here, whether it's uh, preceptal cellulitis, orbital cellulitis, orbital apex syndrome, or cavernous sinus syndrome. So we'll let that run for a couple seconds there, Saba, but that's some fascinating pictures and video you've got there. All right, so it looks like people mostly voted for orbital apex, some cavernous sinus, and some orbital sinus. And then um, the next question is, what is the next step? Would you do a B-scan ultrasound? Would you do a CT, CTA of the brain in orbits, um, an MRI, MRV of the brain in orbits, or would you do a lateral canthus repair and start her on antibiotic? So it seems most of your audience wants to do some sort of imaging. Uh, yeah, so MRI, MRV, great. So uh, based on our initial assessment and plan, um, we determined that she has deficits in cranial nerve three, four, six in the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. Um, her vision did pinhole quite um, uh, improved with pinhole and she didn't have a reverse um, RAPD on the initial assessment, even though her pupil were dilated. So we believe she had an intact optic nerve function at the time. Um, so it was determined that she has uh, cavernous sinus syndrome and possibly overlying um, infection from this. And 
because of the history of trauma and that uh, some time had passed since this trauma, there was a concern for either traumatic or infect infectious um, cavernous sinus thrombosis. So basically we recommended her to um, continue IV antibiotics and started her on uh, and had her do an MRI and MRV. And this was to look for several things. So one to rule out uh, the thrombosis that's causing um, possibly her cavernous sinus syndrome. We also wanted to see if she had a traumatic uh, fistula um, to see if there's been any foreign bodies from the trauma and to see if there's any intracranial involvement from the trauma itself. So looking at the imaging that she had, so she had an MRI, MRV brain and orbits done with GAD, and this is an axial uh, T2 uh, scan with fat suppression, and there's three findings here. So one, she has pre and post septal orbital inflammation that we can see here with the proptosis compared to the left side. She had a few focal fragments along the lateral uh, right orbit that were suspicious for foreign body that we can see here. And she most more posteriorly, she had a linear non-displaced fracture at the margin of her superior ophthalmic fissure as well. Um, the next imaging we go um, in the brain. So the fourth finding is we have the coronal T2 fat suppressed image. And it shows that the right cavernous sinus seen here compared to the left cavernous sinus is actually quite bulky. And there's some hypo-intense and heterogeneous uh, signal within. Um, the hypo-intense filling defect along the right cavernous sinus was very um, uh, suspicious for showing features of a right cavernous sinus thrombosis on that side. Um, she had a fifth finding here on time of flight MRA. We can see that there's a possible signal blush posterior to the right cavernous intraneural carotid artery. And the ICA on the right side is possibly a bit smaller than the left. And so this was suspicious for possibly an indirect carotid cavernous fistula as well. Um, the sixth finding here is that on T1 axial scan, we see that there's enhanced thickening along the lateral wall of the right cavernous sinus here and along the dural convexity of the temporal lobe. And uh, this basically is a sign of venous engorgement or redirected flow in this area. And most interestingly, on the seventh finding, she had diffusion DWI weighted scans. And on the axial cuts here, you can see that she has diffusion restriction involving the um, right temporal pole here, um, as well the ventral aspect of the right pons, this white dot here, and as well all the way to her left superior cerebellar hemisphere. So um, looking at this, it looks like these three regions are all are along a penetrating trajectory of the right cavernous sinus and the right lateral orbital wall. And it uh, shows us that the patient basically had a transorbital traumatic brainstem and cerebellar um, ischemia from this injury. So um, looking at it more in depth, her injury was actually a lot more extensive than um, as seemed on initial exam as well. So looking at the problem list for this patient, she has a lot of things going on. She has absent corneal sensation um, uh, and reduced uh, and, uh, conjunctival chemosis on the right side. She has orbital inflammation infection. She has a foreign body. She has cavernous sinus thrombosis. She has suboxable carotid cavernous fistula as well as brainstem injury. So this really calls for having multidisciplinary involvement for this patient with NeuroRADS, ID, thrombosis, neuros, uh, neurosurgery, and ophthalmology as well. So in order to best um, care for this patient, we kind of need a little bit of background on this rare kind of injury. So needlefish injuries, um, if we um, delve into it a little bit, this is a picture of a needlefish here. She's, uh, the, these sorts of fish are carnivorous with uh, long beaks that can grow up to two meters in length. And they can develop pretty high speeds of 30 to 40 miles um, per hour when they jump. Um, usually uh, injuries involving needlefish involve the trunk and the lower limbs. And most traumas tend to happen at night because the fish are uh, attracted to lights. So it makes sense with our patient, she was using her cell phone light to look in the water to look for another lost phone and that's when it happened. Um, in terms of antibiotic coverage, the uh, concern here is also for Vibrio species that's prominent in their oral flora. Um, Vibrio is a gram negative rod and they're usually associated with eating undercooked seafood and the bacteria is highly uh, salt tolerant. So they're commonly found in various salt water environments and it's important to cover for that. Um, if we go more specifically to see if there's a case close to ours, there's a first case of brain penetration by needlefish was from um, McCabe et al. in 1978. And reading into it, it's actually pretty similar to our case. So it was a 10-year-old boy um, who was in Hawaii. And while he was fishing with his father, he had a, a needlefish jump out of the water. 
and also stab him in the lateral um, area of his right orbit. However, in his case, it had been slightly more angled. So it actually went through and he developed a left carotid cavernous fistula as it had gone across the orbit and into the brain. Um, he also developed a cerebral infarction and left-sided subgural hematoma from this. And uh, because of that, he actually declined quite quickly and um, became unresponsive and comatose. And over a matter of two days, he developed cerebral edema and lost brainstem reflexes. So if we look at his cerebral angiogram, uh, this is the vaginal view, and this is the front um, part of the face, and this is the posterior aspect, and this is the left carotid cavernous fistula with an engorged um, sinus here, and there's actually retrograde flow through the superophthalmic vein and going through the pterygoid plexus, and on the um, the coronal view, you, see, you can see that there's a fistula with um, filling onto the opposite side. So for our patient, the patient, um, because of the multiple um, complexities of the situation, was um, admitted and uh, multiple teams were involved. ID was consulted and they recommended continuing the broad spectrum antibiotics and adding amphotericin. This is to cover for multiple things from the water and from the fish itself, including pseudomonas, uh, strep, vibrio, candida, and other fungi, um, as well from the broken skin barrier, we want to cover staph and group A strep. Um, oculoplastics was involved as well, and they removed the encapsulated foreign body in the lateral orbit on the right side, and they cultured it. Um, it didn't uh, come back to grow anything in particular. Um, and other teams that were involved were neuroradiology, uh, stroke, and neurosurgery. And there was a lot of discussion on this end because um, she did have a confirmed cavernous sinus thrombosis, but there was a possibility of having a, a fistula that was uh, hinted on an MRI as well. So there was this question of whether she should be on anticoagulation because of this fistula. But um, on further discussion, it was determined that because she definitely has a traumatic infectious cavernous sinus thrombosis, there's a high risk of thromboembolic stroke from this. And so it was decided to start her on heparin therapy um, and to do a cerebral angiogram to assess for whether she has a carotid cavernous fistula and to evaluate it. So going into a uh, background on cavernous sinus thrombosis, um, this primarily results from bacterial or fungal infections from the face, the oral cavity, the sinuses, or the orbits. And they uh, basically reach the sinus from superficial venous channels like the facial veins, the pterygoid plexus, and they drain from the, uh, these veins to the cavernous sinus. Um, there's extensive input and output um, from venous channels in and out of the cavernous sinus. And some of these include the dural sinuses, the cerebral veins, and all of these areas are non-valvular in um, nature. So the direction of blood flow within the cavernous sinus is really susceptible to change in pressure gradients from infective thrombi. And this really allows for extensive spread of infection from and into the cavernous sinus. Um, it's also been postulated that because of the trabeculated setup of the sinuses within the uh, cavernous sinus, it actually aids in trapping septic emboli and bacteria that have come from anteriorly infected sites. So cavernous sinus thrombosis is a potentially lethal cause of cavernous sinus syndrome, and the clinical manifestations can be rapid, like we saw in the case report, or subacute, more like ours. So her, um, uh, so the initial clinical presentation can start from fever, malaise, having unilateral chemosis, and paraorbital edema that all come from basically the venous congestion and inflammation in the sinus. And then this can progress to continued pressure elevation in the retrobulbar compartment so they can develop cranial nerve palsies, um, internal ophthalmoplegia from the sympathetic or parasympathetic denervation, and possibly retinopathy from central vein congestion. This can progress to involve the contralateral eye uh, because the two sinuses are connected and the other eye can also develop a cavernous sinus syndrome from infection spread. And this can also progress to um, involve septic thrombi to surrounding cerebral dural venous sinuses, and um, it can potentiate the development of high ICP and stroke symptoms as well. So basically for management of this, we um, their patients are started on empiric antibiotic therapy um, aimed at broad spectrum coverage. And then it's modified based on whether you have the availability of culture results. And usually that's gone for about four weeks of therapy and to make sure the clinical signs of infection and inflammation are improved. 
Um, early use of anticoagulation can reduce uh, morbidity and mortality. And there's uh, the choice of anticoagulation therapy is debated, but heparin seems to be the one that's favored. And usually it's continued for four to six weeks. Um, the use of systemic steroids to combat inflammation and the edema is not well supported in patients with the cavernous sinus thrombosis. So it's uh, not used. So for our patient, she was um, started on heparin for the cavernous sinus thrombosis, and she had a cerebral angiogram to assess her fistula, uh, a possibility of having a fistula. So this is um, the angiogram for, from her left internal carotid artery. We see that there's good filling on the left side, um, and then there's drainage from the sinuses. So the left side looks okay. And then from the right internal carotid, we see that there's filling and something that's different here is that we see this sort of drainage happening on the other side. So there's uh, abnormality on the right side that we can see here. There's filling on the, in the right internal carotid artery, but then we see progression of um, filling onto the other side as well. So basically the angiogram showed that she has an indirect carotid cavernous uh, fistula on the uh, right side um, where an artery um, is filling into the cavernous, uh, uh, an artery branching from the internal carotid artery is filling into the right cavernous sinus. It's going across um, the intercellular um, connections here and it's filling the left cavernous sinus that's then draining in the petrosal sinus and going down down the um, internal jugular vein. Um, it, the angiogram also showed that her right cavernous sinus appears completely thrombosed, and there is also no other outflow from this sinus. So the superior ophthalmic vein on the right side and the um, inferior petrosal sinuses were also not filling. So it showed that um, the drainage was extensively compromised from thrombosis. So if we look at the cavernous sinus here, there's small paired venous structures on either side of the pituitary fossa, and it holds a lot of significance because there's a lot of important anatomy in this area. Um, and uh, if we look at the diagram here on the lateral wall, we have the cranial nerve three, four, um, the ophthalmic division, the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve, as well as the sixth nerve near the ICA and medially of the uh, pituitary gland and the sphenoid sinus. Um, there's a lot of pathology that can affect this area, and, and in general, anything that causes these manifestations, we call it cavernous sinus syndrome. And some of the things that can cause cavernous sinus syndrome can be things like vascular disorders, like thrombosis in our patient, or fistula also in our patient, um, and other things like neoplasms, infectious or non-infectious inflammatory disorders. So looking at why, how our patients develop this fistula, we look at the anatomy here, and uh, this is the cavernous sinus. We see the internal carotid artery enters the cavernous sinus inferiorly, and it has five segments, the uh, posterior vertical segment, posterior genu, the horizontal segment, the anterior genu, and the anterior vertical segment. And then the ophthalmic artery comes off superiorly. Um, within this segment in the cavernous sinus, there's two main branches. So the MHT or the meningohypophyseal trunk and the infralateral trunk or the ILT. Um, and in our patient, there's an indirect carotid cavernous fistula that's um, coming from the MHT here and filling the cavernous sinus. And these two vessels are mainly involved in supplying extra cavernous structures like the um, intracavernous cranial nerves or the pituitary gland in the tentorium. Um, if we look at the venous system, we see that the cavernous sinus shown here and here gets a lot of output from different venous sinuses, as well as the superior ophthalmic vein. From the cavernous sinus, there's a lot of channels going to the opposite side, to the left side, and both of them each drained to the petrosal sinuses and the pterygoid plexus and the basilar plexus. Um, and so in our patient's angiogram, we see that not only does she have a thrombosis on the right side, but her MHT is leaking into her right cavernous sinus. It's going leaking across to the left side because there's no output from the extensive thrombosis. And there's a fistula that's tracking it and causing leakage onto the other right side. So she has a CCF and a CST. And basically it makes sense here with her angiogram, it's going through the ICA, coming off the ICA into the venous system and going across and draining. So basically for this, she was uh, continued on heparin um, for a period of one week. And after one week follow-up, we didn't see much clinical um, improvement in her picture while she was on anticoagulation. Um, and at that one week, 
mark uh, ophthalmology was called because she had her visual acuity. Um, she noticed that it had reduced and on measurement, it had reduced to counting fingers. She'd also developed um, a reverse RAPD and red desaturation. And um, on re-examining her, it was felt that this is likely possibly um, like delayed optic neuropathy from the trauma. There is no other new pathology saw seen on exam and no vein occlusion seen on exam that could have been from elevated retrobulbar uh, pressure um, contribution. So there was another multidisciplinary reassessment done after she had the cerebral angiogram that confirmed the fistula, and um, it was determined that the heparinization that she's on right now lessens the chance of her fistula closure, and there's a risk now to the contralateral good eye if this fistula remains open. Um, so because she had remained stable on the cavernous sinus thrombosis aspect, it was decided palsies can actually be observed um, even months after the injury. Um, so thank you to Dr. Um, Ali and the fellows, George and Amelia as well for helping with this case. That's a fascinating case, Saba. I just kept getting more and more interesting as we went along. And a great presentation, thank you. Actually, George was telling us about this case last night at dinner. Um, George is here, I don't know if he's got any thoughts, but he has some cool insights as well. George, are you still there? Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. For the audience who doesn't know, by the way, George is our oculoplastics fellow. Yeah, so that was a great uh, presentation, Saba. I think uh, you hit a lot of points. I think that one of the questions was, uh, was this actually a, an infectious uh, thrombosis or was it purely traumatic, especially with her presentation of kind of orbital swelling and engorgement? You know, it's it's hard to say for sure, and you can never be sure, but I kind of, uh, at this point, wonder if the whole thing wasn't just from the fistula and the uh, thrombosis, and I wonder if she never had actually any infection in the first place, just because of the way she responded. Of course, we had to kind of cover her with antibiotics, but um, there's a lot of layers of complexity to this case. Um, another interesting thing was, um, we were talking to the to the neurosurgeons, actually, and a lot in a lot of these cases, when the forces causing uh, neuropathy or shearing, you do often see improvement over time. Um, and so uh, sometimes that improvement can take several months. So that kind of is in keeping with some of the improvements she's had. Yeah, but that, that was a, a fascinating case. It really is a horror story. You presented it so well. Uh, thank you. You know, it's interesting that she developed almost instantaneous ophthalmoplegia. Do you think that is due to the swelling right away? Or do you think there is something else that that happened initially that uh, is there any kind of uh, toxins or pharmacologic reason that you would have this? Uh, I, I would say that uh, the the bill of the um, uh, needlefish probably just tickled her nerves directly. So there may have been direct trauma because it went through. Uh, there, there is another image and Saba showed this extremely well. Um, but there's images of the sort of the pawns being tickled. You can see a, you can see this reaction. She showed it going all the way back to the cerebellum. So that thing went in all the way. So it touched or stretched those nerves uh, on its passage through it. And um, and uh, and so you know there's that's probably the reason. There was just direct trauma to the cavernous sinus that uh, that caused it. That's what I thought. And and I have to say this was a group effort. Um, George was heavily involved, as well as the residents and fellows, and also uh, Dan DeAngelis. And I wanted to uh, have a shout out to Ahmed. I don't know if he's there, Ahmed Almir, um, because he uh, was the first resident to see this patient. And he actually knew what this fish was through his traditional knowledge of his background. He said, oh, yeah, just be careful about fishing at night because these fish jump out at the boat. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, yeah, this sort of thing happens. I said, how would you know this? Is the first time in my life I'd ever heard about a needlefish, um, and so there. So if you're ever going to Cuba, don't look at the, don't shine your light into the water, because a fish may jump out at you. Um, and there was the question of uh, the uh, foreign body that was removed. Um, we thought that it was um, uh, either it could have been a fragment of a tooth or a chip of bone. Uh, we were never sure exactly what it was. It was just a little firm fragment. George removed it from the canthus. And she has no other manifestations that I'm aware of of the brainstem injury. Um, so if there's any component of her ocular movements that are related to brainstem, it's hard to distinguish. Um, but she has no, you know, ataxia or speech problems or anything like that. George, maybe you can confirm. You, you saw her last. I don't follow her anymore. 
Yeah, I think the last time I saw her was, I think, right before the 10 month follow up. And uh, um, I mean, she looks really great. A lot of the prop doses, I think, improve. And um, she still has just the aberrant regeneration, but her corneal sensation has returned. And I think that's helped a lot in improving her ocular surface. She had a lot of chemosis during the initial phase, and we had to do several tarsorphies to protect from the exposure. I don't know if there's any other questions. Well, thank you, Saba. That was that was a great case and a great presentation. And at this point, we'll hand it over to Mohab for his presentation. Mom will have to do that. Several, do you know which which type of water these fish are common in? Sorry, fish I didn't catch it. Right? Where, where are these needle fish? Where the, where's home for them? Um, I know like the regions they like is like uh they were saying like near bays and um in salt water as well, but I don't know in particular like the geographic location where you see them. So I think it's throughout the world, Avandeep. That's why Ahmed knew about it. And I think yeah. they're they're scattered throughout the world. So just be careful in shallow water in Costa Rica. Uh, all right, my floor yours. All right. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Mohab. I'm one of the third year residents uh, um, uh, at the Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences. Um, and uh, I'll be presenting a mysterious case of endophthalmitis uh, with Dr. Asim Ali. So uh, to give um, the background of our case, um, it was in, back in the December of 2021, as uh, Dr. Ali mentioned earlier, uh, around Christmas time, a two-year-old female who uh, uh, presented initially to the Department of uh, Health Sciences North at Sudbury with a left eye discharge and uh, fever and lethargy that has been getting worse over the past 24 hours. Prior to this, the mother has mentioned that the patient was having left eye erythema, which she was treating with uh, polysporin drops. Uh, because uh, the daycare that the child was going to had confirmed cases of conjunctivitis. Uh, additionally, the patient had a one month history of mild rhinorrhea and uh, cough. However, no other symptoms were reported. Um, the patient had a past medical history of neonatal abscissance syndrome because of the maternal use of methadone during pregnancy. Um, she was not on any other medications and besides polysporin, she was not using any other drops. She doesn't have a past ocular history and um, there was no uh, history of trauma for the patient. Uh, so in the department, uh, in the emergency department of uh, at Sudbury, uh, she had uh, uh, COVID and RSV swabs done and uh, ophthalmology over there was involved who examined the patient and um, uh, did conjunctival swabbing and uh, ordered blood cultures and CT scan of the orbits. So this is uh, the CT scan was, uh, that was done there and it uh, revealed a mild left orbital fat stranding and asymmetric soft tissue thickening. There uh, was a, a mild asymmetric fullness of the left lacrimal gland, which is um, obvious on the CT scan here. There was also uh, opacification of the mastoid air spaces and uh, the middle ear cavities on both sides, which was concerning for uh, uh, otomastoiditis. Uh, to give a summary of the ophthalmological examination over there, so uh, it was a difficult examination, but the patient was sedated with ketamine, and um, uh, a six millimeter hypopion was noted with um, a semi purulent, uh, hazy AC, but no corneal ulcer perforation or obvious scleral corneal uh, injuries were noted. Um, there was also no proptosis. Uh, given the complexity of uh, the case, uh, the 
ophthalmologist at Sartbury uh, referred the patient uh, to be transferred uh, to sick kids for further management uh, for suspected endophthalmitis. Uh, once the patient uh, arrived at uh, the SickKids ED, uh, ENT was also uh, consulted given the CT scan findings that we discussed and uh, uh, was initially had like a very brief um, uh, examination by the ophthalmology resident at the emergency department before being transferred directly to OR to have examination uh, under anesthesia by ENT and ophthalmology. Additionally, um, uh, ID was consulted uh, to uh, initiate antibiotics. So to summarize the findings of examination under anesthesia, uh, ENT examined first and there was no evidence of uh, acute uh, process happening. Uh, so they didn't suspect that there was an acute ear infection or mastoiditis. They just noted uh, that there is a bilateral middle ear effusion and they recommended outpatient follow-up with audiology testing. Um, and then ophthalmology findings are summarized in the table uh, below. So pressure was normal, and then uh, eyelids uh, and lashes were normal in the left eye. And uh, the left eye showed uh, in injection of the conjunctiva. There was haze in the cornea, and uh, hypopion was filling the entire AC, there, so there was no uh, view of any of the structures posterior to it. Here is a video uh, showing the exam findings. Um, we carefully, because of uh, the suspected endophthalmitis, we carefully checked the eye uh, for lacerations in the uh, sclera or uh, open wounds in the conjunctiva. So here is uh, the video showing the examination. Essentially, there was uh, there were no uh, lacerations to the conjunctiva, sclera, or cornea. So now we're going to ask our audience the first question. Uh, so, what would be the next step that you would like it to do in like assessment or management of this patient? Um, uh, go ahead and inject uh, intravitreal antibiotics. Do an ultra uh, UBM and uh, B scan or proceed with a parse plan of vitrectomy or uh, do an inoculation. Thanks, Mo. I mean, we've got overwhelming support for UBM and B-scan and your next step here. All right, so uh, as like the audience has guessed, uh, given that there was poor view of the structures posterior, uh, posterior to um, the hypopion that we have here, such as the iris and the retina, it was important to assess uh, what's going on uh, to make sure there, there are no foreign bodies, even though there was no foreign body noted on the CT scan, but it was also important to look uh, for tumors, which could be on the differentials uh, for the hypopion that the patient have, and uh, to assess the situation of the retina and see if the retina is still attached or detached. Um, so the UBM revealed a normal appearing iris and lens, and the B-scan just showed a superior vitreous debris with an attached uh, retina. So uh, we went ahead and did an AC wash. So after the eye was uh, prepped uh, using an MVR blade, we created an infrotemporal incision, uh, uh, and uh, AC maintainer also was inserted through a second wound that was made supranasally. Uh, here is a, uh, uh, the removal of the hypopion using a vitrector from the anterior chamber. As you can see in the video here, uh, how fibrinous and tough the, the, the hypopion and the fibrinous, fibrinous membrane in the anterior chamber was. Um, Eventually, with some effort, we were able to peel it from the anterior chamber and from the iris surface. And uh, it was extracted successfully from the anterior chamber. Let me just forward here a little bit.
All right. So after the AC wash, uh, fundus examination was performed, uh, which only revealed a dark red reflex with poor view of the macula and the vessels because of uh, vitreous debris. Uh, we injected intravitreal vancomycin, uh, ceftazidim, and uh, uh, dexamethasone, um, and the wounds were sutured with tenovico. A preliminary diagnosis of endogenous endophthalmitis uh, was made. And uh, the patient was admitted under ophthalmology for uh, daily mon monitoring. And of course, uh, uh, this, a sample from the AC was sent out to uh, microbiology uh, for culture and sensitivity. Um, so once the patient was on the ward, the ID assessed the patient uh, on the same day after the examination under anesthesia. And they initiated the CNS dosing of IV antibiotics, including uh, meropenem and uh, vancomycin. Uh, topical and, uh, antibiotics were also initiated uh, and uh, with Predfort and, um, uh, and atropine. Uh, so uh, an earlier blood culture that was done uh, at uh, Sudbury eventually came back negative after a few days. Uh, and the AC uh, sample grew Neisseria meningitidis, uh, which was fairly surprising given the patient has not shown any symptoms of uh, CNS invol involving uh, meningitis or uh, signs of meningismus or a rash uh, in the body. Um, uh, so ID started the ceftriaxone given that um, Neisseria meningitis is sensitive uh, to, to that antibiotic. And uh, they recommended uh, involving immunology to rule out uh, underlying immune deficiency conditions that can increase uh, the, the, risk, uh, the, the risk of um, Neisseria infections. They also um, are tried to establish the, the uh, immune status with the, with the family and uh, initiated the immunization once the, it was known that they were not immunized to meningococcus. Um, the patient had, uh, so the patient was assessed by immunology and uh, uh, she had no history of recurrent infections. Uh, there was no known family history of immune deficiencies. Uh, it was unclear what's her immunization status to, uh, uh, with the meningo meningococcal vaccination. Uh, however, uh, the immunology team uh, wanted to rule out uh, complement deficiency uh, disorders and asplenia or hyposplenia, which might be associated with in increased risk of uh, Neisseria infections. Uh, a summary of the uh, of the tests that they have ordered is uh, is listed below. So uh, that includes a CT of the abdomen to assess uh, uh, the spleen and uh, uh, whether there is a congenital asplenia. Uh, they also recommended the lumbar puncture, which we will uh, talk about a little bit further in a, in a bit. Um, complement levels, immunoglobulin levels, CBC and differential, lymphocyte phenotyping, um, isohemoglutinin, uh, total protein with albumin, serologies for tetanus, diphtheria, measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella. Uh, so upon further discussion about uh, doing a lumbar puncture with ID, uh, they recommended or like they suggested that uh, there is no need to do uh, the lumbar puncture given that the patient was not showing any systemic symptoms of meningitis and that the patient was already on CNS uh, penetrating antibiotics for a few days. So it was unlikely to change the management of this patient at this point. Uh, the event, eventually, all of this workup came back uh, negative, uh, there were, and no source uh, of infection was detected. So we suspected that this is uh, likely a case of Neisseria endogenous endophthalmitis uh, that's uh, isolated without CNS meningeal, meningococcal infection. Um, so over the course of, the, of her admission, the patient was able to... Um, uh, with uh, daily ophthalmological examinations, uh, it was noted that the patient was able to open her eyes more spontaneously. However, she remained very photophobic and uh, ex making uh, bedside examinations or clinical clinic examinations uh, challenging. Uh, her conjunctiva was uh, conjunctival injection was milder. However, uh, in some injection persisted. There was also a small hypokin that started to reform. 
So we decided to take the patient back uh, for another examination under anesthesia. Uh, uh, and the anterior segment uh, appeared to be better. However, there was worsening of the posterior involvement. So we re-injected the patient with intravitreal cystazidine and dexamethasone. Uh, we referred the patient for assessment uh, by the retina service. However, they decided that there was no role for vitrectomy due to the improvement of, uh, of the anterior segment and posterior segment examination following the second um, intravitreal injections. After staying in the hospital for around two weeks, the, fa the family decided to leave uh, the hospital AMA due to social uh, uh, difficulties. Uh, however, they continued to receive IV antibiotic treatment at uh, Health Sciences Center at, um, at Sudbury. So after like the first fo follow-up was after three weeks and uh, uh, she was seen by us and by uh, ID. So ID uh, decided uh, to stop her uh, antibiotics at this point after she has been on them for roughly a total of uh, three and a half weeks. Uh, the patient came uh, to our office uh, for outpatient follow-up uh, with the retina service, and uh, her examination findings are uh, listed here. So uh, the patient was noted to, ha to have difficulty fixing and following, and she really objected to covering the right eye. Conjunctiva was still mildly injected. Uh, there was some irregularity in the pupillary margin, but there was still hazy view of the optic disc and the vessels. Uh, the red reflex has improved compared to like prior presentation, but there was still a poor view of the, of the retina overall. So another B scan was done and no RD was noted. And then um, the patient was, uh, when, when they returned uh, to the two month follow-up, there wasn't much change compared to this visit. So the retina team, uh, uh, so first bef before we discuss what the retina team uh, uh, did, we're going to ask the audience what would be your next uh, step in the management of this patient. Continue to observe, increase the topical steroids, start oral steroids, proceed with a parse plan of vitrectomy, restart IV antibiotics. Thank you, Mom. We'll, we'll let that run for a couple, of minutes, a couple of seconds there. Another very interesting case. Here's your results. The audience is split between observation and vitrectomy. Mm -hmm. So uh, because of the, the, the vitreous debris were significant and we were worried that this is affecting uh, her vision and uh, might be a cause of amblyopia uh, in the future. Uh, and that was also uh, rendering uh, posterior segment examinations more difficult. Uh, the, the retina team arranged for a parse plan of vitrectomy with air fluid exchange, which was done roughly around five months after uh, the initial presentation. Uh, at, the first at the very first follow-up after uh, the vitrectomy, the patient had already very quickly developed an anterior capsular and cortical cataracts, which quickly progressed into uh, an intumescent cataract that's uh, uh, showed in the in the picture here, uh, the patient was re-referred for doctor to Dr. Ali for planning for uh, cataract extraction and intraocular lens implantation, which was done uh, at, a, at the nine month time post uh, admission. Um, so after the vitrectomy and the cataract uh, extraction at the one year follow-up, this is a summary of her exam findings. So uh, the patient's vision was 2,600 at that time, and pressure was normal, and essentially the rest of the examination uh, was unremarkable. The retina was attached. However, there, uh, there was still some uh, difficulty uh, viewing the optic nerve and some of the blood vessels. Um, so essentially, uh, the question is, what's exactly the, the, the cause of the poor vision here. Uh, and we believe it's a combination of multiple factors that uh, can be because of the initial infectious process, retinal toxicity, and uh, the subsequent amblyopia that happened from the vitreous debris and the cataract. Um, so 
to do to give like a, a few brief points on um, uh, Nigeria meningi meningitis uh, uh, endogenous endophthalmitis. Uh, it's a very rare cause of endogenous endophthalmitis, and the most common type is uh, serotype C. In our case, was serotype W. Uh, in general, it's uh, it's associated with uh, uh, CNS involvement. However, it can be isolated uh, without CNS involvement in up to 25% of the cases, and over half of uh, the affected uh, patients are from the pediatric population. The rest involve healthy young individuals. Uh, the average age is 25 years old. Uh, this contradicts, uh, you know, like prior beliefs and studies that uh, this disease is uh, is linked with, other, like underlying immunosuppression or immune uh, immune disorders and comorbidities. In general, Nigeria is treatable with uh, third generation uh, kephalosporins, uh, both. Uh, so similar to any endogenous endophthalmitis with systemic and intravitreal uh, treatment. Uh, there, there are no reports on uh, doing an initial vitrectomy in particular in this subset of patients, but similar to other causes of endogenous endophthalmitis, uh, late vitrectomy is generally preferred um, uh, in addition to uh, antibiotics and uh, and uh, finally, the role of systemic uh, of steroid treatment remains controversial. To summarize some uh, uh, take home points here, it's important to, uh, in any uh, end of salmitis case, it's important to rule out traumatic and uh, exogenous uh, uh, cases. Uh, causes of, uh, of endophthalmitis first before uh, diagnosing end endogenous endophthalmitis. And then about the Nigeria meningi uh, meningitis, endogenous endophthalmitis, they can occur without uh, signs of uh, meningitis in up to 25% of the cases. The main stage of treatment is IV and intravitreal antibiotics, uh, similar uh, to what happened here, usually a multidisciplinary disciplinary appro approach is required in the management. Uh, and then always important to take uh, into consideration early on the sequelae of endophthalmitis and managing its complications to prevent amblyopia. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Moha. That was a very, very interesting case. There's a comment from um, Dr. Ian that she, she might have suggested an LP earlier. As you said, um, you guys did consider that, but ID felt that it wouldn't change management. Very, very interesting case. I mean, both cases this morning were, were excellent and certainly very, um, very much a definition of weird and wonderful. So thank you for, for bringing that forward to us because, you know, these are the types of cases we don't often see um, once we get under practice. So. Uh, great, great to see those cases. Ask them. I don't know if you have any further thoughts to Mohab's case. Yeah, I mean, I think both uh, Mohab and Saba presented the cases extremely well. I think with this case, um, you know, there was a lot of discussion with ID as to the cause and the source. And we also felt that doing an LP was warranted. The child was put under uh, what um, it, um, happened with this child. This child was extremely difficult to examine and essentially required sedation or general anesthetic each time we wanted to take a look. Um, the family was um, very, um, very stressed by being here in Toronto. So there are some psychosocial aspects to this case also. Um, and so we, we sort of offered them to do an LP under general anesthetic so the child wouldn't have to be subjected, but they still declined. And their reasoning was, is that if it's, if, even if it's present, it doesn't change their management. Uh, and so the the doses and the susceptibilities of uh, of Neisseria of meningococcus are are such that that really wasn't their concern. Um, and the main thing was this hunt for the um, of being potentially immunocompromised, which which uh, which you know which, which uh, I've showed that it wasn't really um, wasn't didn't wasn't really borne out. So it's just one of those random things apparently she's exposed to, and then she she developed the infection throughout. I mean, I think. The good things were that it wasn't in her other eye, um, so it was just a monocular, and um, she's uh, she's 
her vision is poor. We've given her glasses and started patching, and we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm not sure they're going to be able to do that. Um, Nancy just asked a question: Was there an OCT? Um, no, we haven't. Uh, of the, I'm assuming of the retina. Uh, no, because um, we haven't put her back to sleep yet. Um, if we need to put her to under anesthetic, then I think we'll go and do an OCT. That's an excellent idea uh, to see if there's been any um, damage to the retina. Um, she definitely is not cooperative enough to do it awake. Second Nazrin's comment there, uh, just how well these cases are managed with the contribution of the whole team at SickKids. We're, we're very fortunate to have you guys. So, so thank you. I, I completely agree with that Nazrin's comment there. Yeah, and, and just to, to shout out to uh, both Rajiv and, and, and Peter were involved in, and both of them were out of town when this uh, poor child came in um, and uh, sort of were both accessible to me to provide some advice on the, at least the initial management. Obviously the parts plan of attracting me was done by uh, Peter Curtis, but um, uh, you know, we rely a lot on our subspecialist, Dan, in the previous case, um, who help us with these very difficult cases. Okay, well, I don't think we have any other questions. Um, so I, I, I'll we'll wrap it up for a minutes early. But once again, I want to thank uh, Saba and Mohan. Um, incredible presentations. You guys did a great job organizing those this morning. And to ask them for um, being faculty supervisor for you guys and bringing those cases forward. It's really interesting to see what goes on um, at Sick Kids. Um, one last question from Dr. Lichter. Um, with respect to the social support that was available to this family, because it seems like that did impact the care here. Um, yeah. What was available to the family of sick kids or at home? Yeah, so that's an excellent question, Myrna. Um, I, I, uh, we didn't really get into all of that. No, the family had a social worker in Sudbury. We had social work with them here, um, child life, all at sick kids. Uh, when the family left AMA, um, I had a long conversation with them and I spoke to the um, pediatrician in chief at Sudbury, and they arranged uh, for them to go directly to the emergency department in Sudbury and get admitted. So actually the child went from hospital to hospital. They just did it on their own. Uh, and, and that's what happened. And, and then they, so the family was very committed to looking after the child, the, the social circumstances or otherwise. But then once the child was admitted in Sudbury, it was much easier for them to look after their, the rest of their family. So, so they're involved uh, in social services, social support through social work and the community workers and sick kids, they're all involved in the care of this family. But that's a very important um, question because the child's care would be affected if these things were not looked after. All right, well, with that, we'll, we'll wrap it up. And uh, ask him, you want to kind of Randall, he's right here. Randall, just say hi. Hey, Randall. Hello, how are you? All right, how are you? <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you. All right, guys. Well, All right. Well, thank you for the cases. Um, once again, enjoy the rest of your day. Stay warm, everybody. I'll see you back at home next week. All right. Bye-bye. All right.